living organisms and the environment now you may be saying okay section a that kind of reminds you of an exam section a and that's true because in hsb your your paper is sectioned into different a b let me go here paper two right paper two okay. is going to be divided let me just go back up so, yeah, paper two is two hours and it's going to be divided into a and b all right and it consists of six compulsory questions each question is going to be worth 15 marks and the answers that are short answers so you don't have multiple choice in paper two so section a now is going to be four structured questions which is going to be you writing a paragraph or a word or a sentence all right section b now is going to be two compulsory questions each worth 15 marks and it's going to be a type of an essay right so even though it's 15 marks you might be saying sir that's an essay and 15 marks that's so unfair but yes that's how it's going to work in paper two we'll go through paper one at the italy because it's very easy it's just a, a hour and a, and a quarter and you really just get to answer 60 multiple choice but let's focus on section a though all right so the, the since you do biology you should have a great idea of all these terms, right? You know what nutrition is. First time hearing that? Nutrition. Oh, no, sir. Okay. So so nutrition is basically the way living, organizes, living organisms obtain or make food to sustain themselves. All right? So that's when you have persons around you, they say, watch your nutrition. They mean watch what you eat all right so animals taking a ready-made food and are called heterotrophs plants make their own food and they are called autotrophs so those are the two terms on the nutrition heterotrophs and autotrophs if you make your own food you autotroph you're an autotroph but if you obtain it from other sources you are a heterotroph have that done Yes, sir. All right. No, obviously, um, because of the classes, it's very short. What I'm going to be doing is not just going through content, but going through past paper questions. So let me show you how I'm going to do that. I'm going to show you um, template. Here we go. So these are answers to revision questions. So we're going to go through revision questions together. And then no, it really shows you the main parts of section A. So let's go to the first part. One second, let's scroll down. So question one. It says, explain three ways in which a car can be considered similar to a living organism and three ways in which it is different from a living organism. You might be saying, sir, how this is human and social biology, but we're talking about cars. Well, that's because the concept is still there inside of a, a car mechanism. So write this question for me and then we're going to break it down together. Three ways in which a car can be considered similar to a living organism and three ways in which it is different from a, um, a living organism. And I, I, I should tell you, this class is really one of... The last time I've had an HSB class was in November because no one really showed the interest and um, it's been a little while since I've done this. So I'm a little bit rough on the edges, but... I'm getting back into it so just let your student let your classmates know that these classes are available it's just that they need to show the interest that they are willing to join all right all right finish writing the question can you finish i'm almost done sir all right Oh, I didn't even realize my camera is off. My bad. So camera's on. That's how we should do it. Camera's on. I'm just turning my camera. Camera. All right. There we go. Slide over here. And slide over here. All right, excellent. Good. All right. There we go. And let me just put your let 
And let's try to small this up. All right, so remember your camera should be on because that's how I know that you're actually paying attention. Because sometimes students will be on their phone the whole time and pretend that they're actually paying attention. All right, good. So explain three ways in which a car can be considered similar to a living organism. Let's try this one. So step one, both a car and a living organism release energy from fuel. Both a car and a living organism release energy from fuel. What does that mean? For a car's perspective, how does a car obtain energy? Think about it. If you don't put this inside a car, it cannot move after a certain amount of time. So what do you put inside the car for it to move? Your mic is muted. Yes, sir. Gas. So you need fuel in the form of gas, which we call petrol. All right. What do you put inside your body now in order for you to walk around and study and do all your daily activities? What What do you need to fuel your body? Um, is, nutrients. Yeah, food. If you don't eat, you can't actually do any activities so that's one similarity right they both need energy or they both release energy from fuel all right the next one both a car and a living organism produce waste and harmful substances let's try to break this down now in the case of a human what do we exhale we inhale oxygen but we exhale Let me write it down for you. No One second. Let me just... Because really and truly, I should have a notebook out so you can take some notes in the same time. So, humans, we inhale oxygen, but we exhale something called carbon dioxide, which is a poisonous gas to us. All right? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, <laughs> right. So, that's a cycle because we're going to talk about how does carbon dioxide gets converted are you breaking up oh, i'm breaking up okay one second let me calibrate the settings all right can you hear me now should be able to hear me now can you hear me now uh, no, sir. all right one second up. one second all right good should be able to hear me now I think I have too many um, tabs running. Let me try to erase some of them. One. Two. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Good. Good. So, we're trying to say now that um, carbon dioxide is released from the body. All right? And it's a poisonous gas to us. So... The question, let's go back to it, was um, a similarity is that both of them release harmful substances. My question to you is, what is released from a car that is considered harmful? So, when they're driving and you see gas coming out the muffler, do you know what it is called? No, sir. It's called carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is released sorry for me carbon monoxide is released from the muffler of cars and carbon dioxide carbon dioxide is released from living organisms well from in back you can put humans an example all right so it's very similar and i want you to highlight for me the prefix all right i wanted to highlight for me di di is a prefix so prefixes are just letters that come before a word so we have di all right 
and then we have mono so if you looked in google right now and you ask google what does the prefix di mean di means two you know a diatomic mo molecule right it's two of something mono means one that's why when you type monochromatic light right is this really a design that covers one light so for example purple blue red right it's shades of one color so this carbon is just one carbon molecule but this this gas now is two carbon molecule right mm -hmm. okay so that's the next one all living organisms are both a car and a living organism produce waste and i gave you two examples carbon monoxide for cars and carbon dioxide for living organisms and then now finally both a car and a living organism can change their position if you accelerate with a car you increase in distance if a animal is running from a predator it increases in distance so they both can change their position i.e move Alright, so those are the three similarities. Alright, now it says, let's go back to the question. You, you're not finished. It says you need to list now three differences between li living organisms. So three differences is that, one, all living organisms are capable of obtaining or making food. A car cannot make its own food. Alright, they cannot be debated. Even though they're very expensive, they can't make their own gas. That's one. Two, all living organisms are capable of increasing in size. If you buy a car today, does that mean it's going to grow in size two years from now? No. It will remain that same okay. size. Exactly. The third one, all living organisms can detect and respond to changes in their environment. And I'm going to give you an example of, an, of a living organism that can do that. Chameleon. Have you ever heard of the chameleon lizard? Pretty sure you've watched it in a movie before. No, sir. All right. So the way that this chameleon lizard works is that, I said work like it's an object, but it can respond to fear and threat by changing into another color. So if, for example, a bird is coming towards it, all right? Based on the plant's color behind it, it will turn to green. So the bird can no longer see it. So look at this example right here. All right? It blends in with its environment. Let me give another example. Um, right here, it's swinging on a branch and it's hiding from its predator. So it's blending with the environment there. All right? They're very ugly, but they're very amazing. All right? The next one. If you have a spray paint on your car, is it possible for you to just change it if you go out in the sun? It's not possible, no. So that means that's a difference. Some living organisms, well, not all, but some living organisms can change based on your environment. Because if you are cold, right, your body begins to produce more heat to warm you up. So that's another application of how we can change to our environment. Understand? And the final one, this is optional because it's at three. The final one you can list is all living organisms can produce a new offspring or a child. But a car can't produce another car. And that's it. That wasn't so hard, right? Oh, sorry, it wasn't hard. Right. But this question is all up to you because you, you, you do biology. So what is a cell? Right, I'm gonna write down exactly what you say. What is a cell? Ready? Let me just color this green. Sorry, red. Here we go. All right. Yes, Chine. So, what is a cell in your own words? Okay. 
Okay, I'll stop you the membrane. Can you repeat that? A cell is a membrane bond unit that contains the fundamental molecules. That contains the fundamental molecules. Some big words. So a cell is a membrane bond unit that contains the fundamental molecules. I'm guessing you're going to say four production or reproduction yes sir all right so let's see if you hit the target all right so a cell is a basic functional unit of all living organisms so picture it as like the starting point for life itself if you have x and in order to turn x into an entire ecosystem x needs to have some type of structure right that can be replicated right so you're you're correct because you said it's a unit and a unit is a is a singular thing so you're correct and i would give you the mark for this all right so let me just write the definition below just so you can compare so a cell is the basic structural and functional unit a cell is the basic structural and functional unit but this is the most important part. You need to tell me that it is involved in all living organisms. Involved in all living. And that's why this will be worth two marks. All right. So because you left off this part right here, then that would have really prevented you from maximizing your full marks in the question. All right in all living organisms okay next question says outline the function of each of the following cell structures right did you do this in in biology yet where you talk about this um, parts of the cell do you know what I'm yes, sir. right so you should know what is a mitochondria? So it should be drilled in your head by now. Mitochondria is where respiration. It's a large number in mm. most cells. So it yes. So let me give you a diagram so you could really get the main idea. I think I have a diagram. Mitochondria. Second, second, here we go. So a mitochondrion looks very similar to this. It's a large section of the cell, all right? And in this section, it is where respiration occurs to release energy for the cell. That's why they say mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Remember that? So it, it's basically where energy reserves is it produces energy for the entire cell so it is where respiration occurs all right the endoplasmic reticulum this is a fancy term it is basically the part of the cell that transports substances All right, and I use that when I was going to school. I use a mnemonic device. You know, what mnemonic devices are things they use to help to remember things. So, if you're trying to remember what endoplasmic reticulum does, you can say, Okay, rhyme it and say meticulous, endoplasmic meticulous. So, it goes through a meticulous process to transport the different substances. That's how you can remember it. All right. I know it's probably a bit um, specific, but you can use these type of devices. So if you, for example, associate with something you see, so whenever you see that object, you get instantly what the definition is. All right. Thirdly, a chloroplast. 
Chloroplast is where the photosynthesis occurs to produce food for the plant. And let's quickly go back to the question. So it, it just wants you to outline the function. So there are, there's a difference between the function and a definition. All right, the definition is going to be just to tell me where it is or um, what it looks like. But the function is going to tell me what it does. So there's a difference there. So what the chloroplast does, you're going to tell me that it is where photosynthesis occurs. All right. The ribosomes, you're not going to tell me that the ribosomes look purple or whatever color. You're going to tell me that proteins are synthesized in this part of the cell. All right. And the final one, cell membrane. Think of, um, let me see, think of the Matrix. I don't know if you watched that movie, it's a very long time ago, where Neo was trapped in this membrane that kept him from, from entering the real world, right? You can think of a membrane, so anytime you think of membrane, is think of the movie, The Matrix. It's basically like a clear plastic or a clear um, section that prevents anything from going out or prevent anything from coming in right until it's required to so until something gives the command that cell membrane will, re will remain closed all right have you written down the different definitions yes sir all right the fourth one let's look at the fourth question it says what would happen to a cell if its nucleus is removed not even going to show you the answer yet. I want you to think about yourself. What would happen if your brain was removed, Shanae? Because the nucleus is like the brain. So what would happen if your brain was removed? Is your brain removed? <laughs> That's a good joke. But So basically, um, if your brain was removed, or if your nucleus was removed, right? the cell i mean like you will not know what to do right the cell would not be able to do its function and what is the cell's function right to divide itself and imp and uh, and completely multiply and to grow yeah right so if your brain was removed you could not do your function which is to learn in hsb class so it's the same idea all right it would not be able to complete its function all right the fifth question says Give four differences and three similarities between the structure of a typical plant cell and a typical animal cell. Alright, here we go. Firstly, let me ask the obvious. Which one would be found in animals and which one would be found in plants? That's the most obvious question, firstly. Which type of cell would you see in a plant? Would it be a plant cell or an animal cell pardon me sir which type of cell would you see in plants would it be plant cell or animal cell i know it's an obvious question but i wanted it to start thinking critically first which type of cell would you see in plants wouldn't it be plant cells yes sir right and animals, you would see typically animal cells. So w w once you've made a clear distinction, now you can try to understand what is the function of the different cells. Now, in an animal cell, you would not find a cell wall. But a plant would have had a cell wall. Yes. Now, from biology... What is the purpose of a cell wall? Do you remember? Uh. Alright. So, let me tell you the definition. So, the purpose for a cell wall... Write this for me. It surrounds... To provide protection. Right. Exactly. So it is tough and flexible, but it provides protection and support as a filtering mechanism. So it's the same thing as I said before that allows some things to go through and some to come in. 
all right but my question to you we, we like to be an analytical so why doesn't an animal cell have a cell wall Write that for me why doesn't an animal cell have a cell wall all right the reason being animals don't need it because in us using cell walls it's basically used for the plant to maintain its structure that stem that you see yes, sir. right so it allows oh. plants to stand upright basically but does a does an animal need to stand upright all the time through the day no right that right so animal needs to remain flexible it doesn't need to be rigid right so that's the main definition as to why animals don't have a cell wall because cell walls in theory just holds the plant upright so that at all times through the day it maximizes its sunlight capture because if a plant was drooping it's not going to get all the sunlight it could but based on the fact that an animal needs to hunt for its own food now right it just needs bones and not necessarily rigid structures So that's where animals get their support from bones not cell walls all right the next one it says an animal cell does not have chloroplast or chlorophyll and i'm going to ask you the same question i just gave you a clue chloroplast is used to do what to help the plant make their own Can you repeat that for me? Right. right. Is it shape or food? Food. Right. Chloro. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so whenever a, a plant cell has chloroplast, that is what is used to make their own food. So that's why they need to stand upright through the day to get the sunlight because that's a catalyst to actually produce glucose. I'm going too fast. But just keep in mind, animals hunt for food plants make their own food all right and chlorophyll is the pigment that is used to produce their oh. own food right so that's why animals don't need it they don't need to be green because they actually need to hunt for the food all right the next one An animal cell may have small vacuoles with differing contents scattered throughout the cytoplasm right and we're going to answer why does animals only have small vacuoles so when you finish writing this just write for me why do animals have small vac vacuoles let me write it down why do animals have small vacuoles technology is amazing okay I mean, because they don't need to store as much water as the plants. Mm-hmm. Because remember, I think there's a percentage as to how much of a plant is actually water, and it's very high, right? Even though we're 70% water, compared to an animal, which is almost 93%, right? It's completely different. So we don't need to store that much content in our body, all right? Because we continuously sweat. I don't think plants sweat. All right, so we, we use that ratio of water more than the plant, so we don't need to store it. Okay, so we need a small vacuole. The next one, um, give another one. It says animal cells may contain glycogen granules as a food store. Plant cell may contain glycogen. That's a good question. Write it down for me. Glycogen, G L Y C O G E N. All right, what is glycogen? All right, so glycogen comes from glucose. All right, and this is a form of energy storage that is found in animals. So picture as this. You see when animals convert food 
into energy, that energy needs to be stored somewhere temporarily because animals never use 100% of their energy one time. Correct? So that is what the glycogen is for? Right. It's basically like a large store. bank. You hold the energy in there and you pull some, you withdraw some of the money from it each time when you're hunting or you're sleeping because you do use energy to sleep. All right? So glycogen is a large storage for a glucose. So this is kind of misleading because it says food store, but it means food storage. All right, next one. All right. Animals have varieties of different shapes and plant cells are usually round, square, or rectangular. And I want you to think about this. What would be the best shape to ensure that each section of your, um, let's say, surface gets equal amount of sunlight? Wouldn't it be a circle? Or, a, yeah, wouldn't it be a circle? All right. Let's look at um, the, the, the most famous uh, example, sunflower. All right. Did you know that when there is no sunlight, guess what sunflowers do to get sunlight? they actually turn to each other and use their each other as their source of light which is really sad and kind of cool but that's the purpose behind why they are so circular in shape to ensure that all facets of their surface gets equal amount of sunlight all right and when there is no sun let me i think i can find a picture sunflowers it when up. <laughs> let me show you sunflowers when the there is no sun do sunflowers face each other when there is no sun unless it was a myth let me actually check because i act, i used to believe that since i was a kid okay they do not So the, the research shows that sunflowers do rely on one another. So it's true. Sunflowers do rely on one another for certain physiological functions. Right? But they, they don't physically turn to each other when there is no sun. But they do rely on each other. Alright? So that was a little myth. And we just debunked it. The next one now. It says state three similarities between plants and animals cells all right so both cell types are surrounded by a cell membrane which we just understood was basically like in the matrix when neo wanted to escape it basically only lets some things go out and some things come in all right both cell types possesses cytoplasm but what is cytoplasm So I tell me what is cytoplasm? Alright. Now to explain this, I don't want you to answer yet. I want you to think of um what's the best way to explain this? Okay. When you're drinking uh Gatorade, have you ever drinking Gatorade before? Yes, sir. Alright. Now think about it. Isn't Gatorade majority of it, isn't it just water? Yes, it's just water. Right, but they put something in there called electrolytes, all right, which is basically something in the water that makes your body more receptive to getting energy, all right? So in the case of cytoplasm, it's really a liquid inside of the, 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 the cell that makes it easier for the transportation, for the absorption, all the processes to be easier, all right? So... Well. So it, it, con it contains water, it contains salts, but also different molecules. And that helps every function inside a cell to be more functional. Alright? Yes, sir. But it also, it also has a second function, really. Because if I have a structure in the cell 
I'd like to maintain it. So at the same time, the cytoplasm is not liquid. It's more of a semi-liquid because it holds things in place. So you can put it as your second function. It holds things together. That's why when you jump up and down, your body don't just miraculously fall apart. Because your cytoplasm in there holding the functional structural cells together. All right? Okay. Yes, sir. Next question. What features would enable a scientist to distinguish a bacterial cell from other cells when viewed under the microscope? What features would enable a scientist to distinguish a bacterial cell from other cells when viewed under the microscope? All right, let's go here. Okay, now, a bacterial cell, it doesn't have a true nucleus. In its basic function, a bacteria is just um, there to spread, but it doesn't necessarily have a function. All right. So, in in the case of completing a task, it does have a nucleus, and um, other membrane-bound organelles such as mitochondria, which are found in cells, are absent in a bacteria. So that's the main distinguishable format you can use. So looking out for a nucleus and looking out for a mitochondria, because if there's no energy source and there's no brain of the cell, then it isn't a cell. Okay, They'd, and also their DNA would be seen in a region called the nucleoid, which would lack a nuclear membrane, and also in smaller regions called plasmids through the cytoplasm. But essentially the answer is, because a bacteria doesn't have a nucleus and a mitochondria, that makes it distinguishable from an actual true cell. Alright, question 7, finished. Question seven. Explain the need for cell specialization in multicellular organisms. Organisms. Explain the need for cell specializations in multicellular organisms. Firstly, what is cell specialization? Think about you having a task to do, a group task, right? You assign one person to print the paper, another person to draw on the paper, and another person to present the presentation, all right? That means you carry out specific functions in order to complete that assignment. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. So, when becoming specialized, right, you are more efficient because if everybody was printing paper, then everybody was to draw on the paper, then everybody presented, you wasted resources and time. So in order to maximize efficiency, cells assign specific tasks to specific um, um, parts of the cell, right? And they carry out functions. And underline the word efficiently for me. Efficiently. Because think about this, which is sad, but it's true. Everything that is a living organism has an expiry date. All right? In order to maximize how long that organism would be alive for, they need to use energy wisely or efficiently. That's true, sir. Yeah. But not even just expiry date. Let's say through your daily activity. Isn't there some periods of the day where you just feel like you're in a slump and you're tired? Yes, sir. Right. Typically, it's before meals. So, um, that's probably why, too. But <laughs> that's the reason why your cells need to be more, even more efficient. Because you have a limited amount of energy throughout the day before you need to be resupplemented. 
whether that's through sleep, whether that's through scrolling on social media, or whether that's through drinking water. You decide. All right, self 7B. Name three different types of cells found in a human body and give the function of each. And then I'm going to leave you to do um, question eight for homework. All right? Okay, sir. So final one, name three different types of cells found in the human body and give the function of each. So the first one, the epithelial cell. Oh. No, to get this one out of the way, I'm going to still teach you how to use etymology. Let me write that word down. Etymology. Etymology is a study of the root oh. of words, right? So if, for example, you see a word that says epithelial. One second, I'm just... I'm not perfect. Let me get the spelling. Epithelial. Epithelial. What is the prefix of this word? Isn't it E-P-I? Epi. All right. No, yes, from, E-P-I. Right. Now, from your biology class, you should know that your skin has two main layers. The dermis and the epidermis, right? Dermis. Right. Yes, sir. Where's the epidermis? Is the epidermis on the inside of your body or is it on the outside of your skin? Um, Let's let Google help you. The outside. The outside and you will be correct. So the word epi, let me just prove it to you. Prefix epi. Let's look at the definition for the prefix epi. It means over, near, at, before, or after. Alright? So it's basically on the outermost. So, yeah. So that's why you hear, when you hear dermis, it means the outermost la layer, which is the skin on the outside of your body. So when you hear epithelial cell, what comes to mind? Isn't it cells that is on the outside of your body? Yes, sir. Right. That's how etymology comes into play. So I'm going to give you um, a root word study guide one day so you can always, even if you don't know the definition of a word, you look like a genius in an exam because you know what the prefixes actually mean, you associate them, and it's simple just like that. So that's how you find the definition for epithelial, by knowing what epi means, which is on the outer. Alright, so epithelial cells, they cover the, and protect the outer body surfaces. Sperm cells. Right? Sperm cells are male gametes. Each sperm cell fuses with a female gamete during fertilization to, perf to form a zygote. We're going to get into specifics of what a gamete and a female gamete along with zygote is in another class. Alright? And the final one. Yes, sir. Egg cells. So, egg cells are over... These are the female gametes. Each ovum fuses with a male gamete during fertilization to form a zygote. So, the, so really, these two are transversal. And we're going to get into the specifics. So, what I want you to practice, well, we did seven questions. So, for question eight, here's what I want you to do. You look like an arts person. So to answer question 8, I want you to actually draw the, the, the definition in a diagram. So you're going to draw the tissue and explain what the tissue is using arrows, draw, um, pencil, pen. But just make it as illustrative as possible. Alright? Same thing for an organ and an organ system. Okay, sir. Alright? Because that would... Here's what's going to happen. You're going to realize you're going to develop a kind of love for human and social biology because you get to really use creativity when you're answering these questions. So for an organ system, you can design a human body and then you just put the specific organs inside and you just illustrate it using the different skills that you know. All right.
and that would make you kind of develop that love for human and social biology this is a good class any questions before we go um no sir all right but sir mm -hmm. can you try um sending this to my email again sure let me send it to you again and just let me know through whatsapp if you st still don't see it i'll just send it through whatsapp all right okay okay right. sir have a good day you too sir